funny, isn't it, what we call groups of animals? A gaggle of geese describes how they sound when they fly overhead. A pride of lions is a reflection of their strength, confidence, and elegance. A parliament of owls anthropomorphizes them so that they are as intelligent and articulate as we think of them. The shrewdness of apes assigns our closest cousins a characteristic we hope we've shed the need for. All this got me wondering, how do collectives of animals get these funny names? Is there some tribunal of linguists that select the most poetic names possible? It turns out that nobody decides, and everybody decides. Most names for groupings began with poets way back in the middle of the last millennium, during the period historians call the Renaissance, when the arts were seeing an unprecedented flourishing. One poet would coin a term and it would catch on as common parlance, unofficially. It's not like there's a rule that you must call a community of alligators a congregation. But that's what we've tacitly agreed to call them. I think it's hilarious that the name given to a collection of giant man-eating lizards is the same name that we give to a collection of people who profess a shared set of beliefs. Beliefs that bind them together in covenant. Of course, congregation isn't the only name we use to describe our gathering as Unitarian Universalists. It might be the most common and the most general, but there are other terms that work just as well. I started thinking about this when I was serving the UU community of the mountains in Grass Valley, California. The word community speaks to what most of UUs join for community. Many of us come with religious traditions built around a particular creed that all are expected to adhere to. Whether we meant to or not, we poke holes in the common understanding of the divine and got a clear message that our questions were not welcome. We felt personally ostracized, so we arrived in our UU communities seeking like-minded people, a theological safety zone, protected enclave in a world that could be hostile to those of us of liberal philosophies, whether we identify as agnostics, humanists, atheists, or something else. The problem with community as protective enclave, though, is that like the religious traditions we've left, it can exclude people. If you've ever looked up enclave in this source, you would have discovered that virtually all its synonyms relate to power, ascendancy, domination, privilege, rule, and sovereignty. For me, the world community is so used and overused that it has become meaningless. A gated community is a neighborhood that leaves out everyone who doesn't belong. Using practices like deed restrictions and red line to prevent minorities from moving in is no longer legal, but is perfectly acceptable now to use walls and guards to keep them out. Communities of identity exist for those who felt excluded from wider communities. Think, think transgender community, sex workers community. I started feeling uncomfortable with the idea of community the first time I read the phrase international intelligence community. In the flash of a moment, the idea went from being warm and fuzzy to cold and threatening. I've always used the word congregation so honestly, I'm glad that word is in our official name here. As a person who grew up Catholic and went to school with Jewish kids, it's one of those words that feels inclusive to me. Synagogues, churches, and mosques, the houses of worship of all three Abrahamic traditions call themselves congregations. And I've also heard the word used to describe Buddhist sanghas and Hindu ashrams. So it connects us across time and space and belief. It's about the coming together, the assemblage of a group of people for a common goal, worship, celebrating that which has the most meaning in our lives. For many of us though, the idea of congregation is troublesome because of its religi re religiosity. For an atheist who disbelieves in the existence of any God in any form, 
or for a secular humanist who sees the human mind and human experience as final arbiters of meaning, the word congregation could feel directly equated to worshiping a god. So I understand how some folks could be uncomfortable with referring to ourselves as a congregation. The first Unitarian Universalist service I attended was the first UU Society of San Francisco. They ordained me 10 years later, and even then, the name, name gave me pause. Actually, I felt a little embarrassed by the name. You see, I grew up in a working class mill town in New England, where having a little above ground backyard swimming pool was a luxury. The upper crust belonged to country clubs in the next town. The Jews went to their club to swim, golf, and play tennis, while the goyim went to their own. They all appeared in the society pages of the Springfield Republican in articles about art openings, opera debuts, and charity galas. I felt like it was a world I would never be allowed into. And if I ever got there, I would be instantly clocked as an imposter and thrown out into the alley by a butler in a tuxedo. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember that a society can be a secular assembly for a common goal, like the Humane Society or the National Geographic Society. It's hard to forget those connotations based on old prejudices I've worked hard to shake. The thesaurus includes association and circle for society and a whole lot of sexist sounding words like fraternity, brotherhood, and fellowship. I guess that's the problem with fellowship. It sounds sexist, dominated by men, as if women were finally let in grudgingly as the result of some legal ruling. When I was in my teens, those country clubs in the next town joined forces and went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court defending their practice of giving the best tea times to men. They lost. Good. Within Unitarian Universalism, we have a proud history of a particular kind of assembly known as a fellowship. In 1948, Frederick May Elliott, president of the American Unitarian Association, revisited an early 20th century plan for lay centers, which would help plan fellowships throughout the United States. Holly Ulbrecht, in the fellowship movement, A Growth Strategy and Its Legacy, notes that, quote, the positive view maintains that the congregations planted as lay-led fellowships between 1948 and 1967 saved Unitarianism from near extinction and converted a, relig a regional religious movement into a truly national one, end quote. Fellowships expanded our association while bringing innovation, vitality, and lay leadership into a religious community greatly in need of fresh air. At the other end of the spectrum is the view that the fellowship movement spawned small, introverted, even hostile groups that did not want to grow or welcome newcomers, did not identify with a larger denomination, and represented Unitarian Universalism in ways that did not reflect the larger movement's self-understanding. Good, bad, or indifferent, fellowship started as small, started as small, and were lay-led in every aspect. And even though they've grown into full-fledged congregations with big budgets, beautiful buildings, and full-time ministers, the name fellowship still means a lot to these groups, even if others can't stand the word. The truth is that there is good and bad that comes with each of these ways of naming ourselves. The words community, congregation, society, and fellowship, each have ways of including and excluding or even conveying two opposite meanings to different kinds of people. Each names a piece of what we are and how we want to be together. It each also leaves something out. And besides being community, congregation, society, and fellowship, we are a lot of other things as well. We are a church. 
Our roots lie in two different churches, and the way we govern ourselves hasn't changed much from what of the congregational church Unitarianism grew out of. And as Adria Evans, chair of the worship committee, pointed out last week, what we do on Sunday mornings, oops, hang on. Oh, I hate leaving you hanging. <laughs> Okay, what we do on Sunday morning looks just like Protestant church. Right down to the orientation of seats toward the pulpit, the classical music, and the tunes of most of the hymns we sing. We are a synagogue. For those of us who believe in God, that God usually looks more like the unified God of the Hebrew Bible than the triune God of Christianity. That theology is what God has declared heretics in the first place. Plus, well, so our worship can look an awful lot like shul, a Yiddish word for school. We value education and expect that a spiritual life is also a life of the mind, exercised in collaboration with one another. We are a parish, marking out a territory that we serve. We aren't called Peacedale UUs. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of South County is a big name to mark out a big chunk of a small state. The county belongs to us and we belong to the county, responsible to its fragile ecosystem and its people, whether or not they join us in worship. We are a temple. As we occupy a building meant for the worship of the human spirit and its connection to the entirety of the universe, a connection that is defined in myriad ways. What matters to us in our temple is that we are public. Not only are we open to all, we aim to occupy the public square, either in a park on a hot Sunday morning, or as prophets in the halls of government speaking truth to power and demanding ethical behavior and policies that are carried out in our name. We are a covenant. Like pagans, we aim to make rituals that celebrate the milestones of our lives the passage of time and the seasons, and the fragility of our relationships with each other and the earth. We commune with the natural world, the elements of air, fire, water, and earth, and the plants and animals we live among. Lately, I've been hearing a lot of abuse through misnaming, people using the dead names of transgender folks, and others who have changed their names for whatever reason mispronouncing names that are less common in the United States, calling groups with opposing political viewpoints, even groups with league names, something else. There's only one reason to misname others, to ostracize them, to attempt to rob them of their power, and making sure they seem delusional, wrong or just foreign. There's a guy named Denis, I just want to say that Kamala, it's not hard to say. <laughs> the guy who repeatedly mispronounces her name in a mocking tone doesn't make her bad. It just makes him look like a bully. I know it isn't the case with the former president, but part of me wants almost to give him a pass because there have been plenty of people who just can't pronounce my name. Good, smart, respectable people who genuinely can't hear the difference between Denis, Denis, and Denny. From Nancy. Denis, the ankle, the elbow. Denis. <laughs> and experience tells me that everyone has words and concepts that make them extremely uncomfortable. In every congregation I have served, there have been, for good reasons, lots of people who bristle every time they hear words like God, or religion, or church, or prayer. Sometimes they are so uncomfortable they ask others to refrain from even using those words. I have to admit, the first few times I was asked not to use certain words or names, I was annoyed. But after a time, I came to see each of these requests as an opportunity for two people to get to know each other better. They were invitations for me to figure out what it is that makes me feel uncomfortable. The thing I know is that if you can approach discomfort 
or intensity of feeling with a sense of curiosity about the world and about yourself, you can do great work together. Instead of arguing about what to call yourselves or what it is you're celebrating on Sunday, wonder together about what it is that makes your heart sore or race with anxiety. And as you do so, as you wonder together, you'll know this. You're celebrating your multiformity and your distinctiveness in a world that desperately needs it, and truly welcoming them in the process. That's the challenge of the project we're working on together. Our strength is in our covenant. For the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of South County to continue to thrive, to achieve our dreams of making justice and being the peace we so long to see, we have to be more than just a congregation. We have to be the community, the society, the fellowship, the church, the synagogue, the parish, the temple, and the coven. Just don't call us a gavel. I never want to be part of a gavel. <laughs> So before we do our final hymn and our closing words, it occurred to me that I'd never checked the chat. Were there um, joys and concerns in chat? Okay, let me, um, all right. Let me do that then, let's see, get to chat.